So thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is a surprise for me that this topic or the speaker could uh, uh, ask for such a turnout. I'm very pleased and honored that you're, uh, you all found a way uh, here, especially in this very busy uh, period of the academic year. I also want to express my sincere gratitude to the Augustinian Institute for giving me the wonderful time I have been given in uh, this uh, period here. I've been here for four months. As Alan said, I have um, recently been appointed Dean of the Faculty, but being here has given me at least some period of rest <laughs> before taking on uh, that duty. Can you hear me uh, at the back of the uh, room? Thank you. So I want to... Um, express my gratitude to the Augustinian Institute and especially to Father Allen and to Anna Misticoni who could not make it here today. Um, she had a dentist's appointment and I don't know what she would have preferred to sit <laughs> uh, at the dentist or to listen uh, to a lecture about truth. In one case she would open her mouth and the other one she would have to close it I suppose. Um, <laughs> And I extend my gratitude to the entire community of Villanova University um, for the welcoming atmos atmosphere, for all things that have been going on in this period, for all the friends I've made, the colleagues, colleagues I have met in a true spirit of Augustinian spirituality. Um, when I proposed this theme to Father Allen and we were looking for an image, he came up with the image that is put on the um, invitation or on the on the poster, so he made the choice. And when he made this choice, I went looking for some background about this picture, about this painting. And in fact, it is very appropriate in uh, many different <coughs> ways. So I want to spend a couple of minutes just discussing this uh, painter by a, uh, a Belgian painter, Philippe de Champagne. With this kind of name, you must have an effervescent uh, uh, spirit of, of beauty, right? Um, he was born in Brussels and then went to Paris to work uh, at the court of King Louis XIII. So it's, it was actually dependent or it was a, 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 an in inhabitant of uh, the Spanish Netherlands at that time, which is present day Belgium. He was a disciple of uh, Peter Paul Rubens, who is much uh, uh, better known, and you can see the descendants of his paintings or the dependence of his, of his work on his master's work as this right figure is St. Augustine pictured by uh, Rubens um, walking down the, um, the, the beach. You can imagine a bishop in, his, in, in all his ornaments walking down the beach and encountering uh, a little child who is uh, bringing water to the sea. Um, he says, what are you doing? You're bringing water to the sea, yes, and answer the child, but you will, uh, I will uh, uh, um, bring all the water to the sea before you can venture to, um, to uh, uh, uncover the uh, secrets of the Trinity, right? So the, 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 uh, the, the endeavor of bringing water to, to, the, to the sea is uh, even, as, as an even better chances of being successful than... Um, finding out the truth about the Trinity. You can see that the rope is in fact exactly the same and even the iconography of, of the figure of Augustine is depicting the same figure. Yet um, what we find in this painting by the Champagne is not just a, a pleasant full or a let's say um, an attempt at, at depicting Saint Augustine. It is in fact a, a theological and political pamphlet, as the Champagne was a follower of a, uh, a, a sect, in fact, or a, a heretic cult called Jansenism, um, uh, which against the official Catholic doctrine promulgated a more pessimistic and austere view on humankind. The founder of this movement, Cornelius Jansen, Jansenius, uh, wrote his book Augustinus, which, which was then very influential um, and put on the index later on. He wrote his book, uh, Augustinus, at the University of Leuven, my home university, where the tower where Jansenius wrote this book can still be visited. Jansenius and the Jansenists emphasized original sin, predestination and the weakness of the will, which gave them the aura of following Calvinists, right? Um, 
but they were in fact interpreting Augustine and following Augustine also they protested against denials of original sin which derived directly or indirectly from the writings of Pelagius and Julian of Eglanum. And you can see at the feet of Augustine there are the works of Pelagius, Julianus, Celestinus who was a friend of Pelagius. He is actually crushing it with his feet and, and pointing at the truth which is much higher. So a pamphlet for Janssen, Jansenist interpretation of Augustine. And the Jansenist movement eventually, by the reactions, provoked by the reactions of the officials, uh, the Jansenist movement also got a political side, protesting against absolutism, the absolutism of the French king. It is no coincidence then that the throne on which Augustine is sitting is an exact reproduction of the official throne of the French kingdom, which is called the throne of Ra Roi Dagobert, the King Dagobert, dating back to the 6th century and last used by Napoleon in the 19th century. And you can see the, the iconography of the throne on which Augustine is sitting is, is exactly the same as this uh, throne of uh, Dagobert. As if the Jan Jansenist painter is saying that Augustine is the one who should be sitting on the throne rather than the absolutist king. Most importantly, this picture um, symbolizes Augustine's quest for truth, which comes from God, you see Veritas here, which comes from God um, to whom Augustine's heart is burning with love. But it's not burning directly towards Veritas, it's burning towards Veritas through the intermediary of his head, which has this strange glow. Yeah? Um, um, symboli symbolizing the, 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 um, the ascent of Augustine's knowledge towards divine uh, truth. In that sense, this picture is in fact the most appropriate illustration of the theme I want to discuss today, and I'll use this uh, iconography throughout the lecture, just to give your eyes also a, bit, uh, uh, a, a few pleasant things to look at. In this lecture, um, as a modest contribution to this university's festival of Augustinian imagination, devoted to truth this week, yeah, which is in fact a, a happy coincidence, I would like to show the intricate relation between the three founding words of Villanova's Augustinian vocation. Veritas, unitas and caritas. In order to do so, I first want to prepare the ground by focusing on veritas with recourse to Augustine's theory of the internal word in on the Trinity. Subsequently, I will examine the, the way in which this theory leads to a hermeneutics of the Bible in on Christian teaching centered around caritas before finally turning towards unitas through an examination of Augustine's theory and practice of biblical interpretation in Confessions 12. So first on to Veritas, Augustine's theory of truth in the Trinity. One of the features of the Trinity as a book uh, is Augustine's endeavor to indicate the parallelism between Trinitarian schemes applied to God and triadic structures within human being as the image of God. Of particular interest for present purposes is the relation between God the Father and the Son as the word of God. God's word is always truthful, says Augustine. It is eternal and fully transparent to God, yeah, as God will always think everything at once. His being is his knowledge. Nosse et esse ibi unum est. So God's being is identical, coincides with God's knowledge. In the analysis of how we as humans relate to this word, Augustine in De Trinitate 15 makes a distinction between two kinds of words. The word in the proper sense, meaning the material utterance or the sensible word, which he calls the external word, and the inner word, verbum interius, which is of the order of thought. The inner word is an inner expression whereby our thought renders our knowledge, entailing that those two faculties of thought and knowledge ought to be distinguished with care. 
So in Augustine's interpretation, thought and knowledge do not coincide, especially not in the human condition. Thought is discursive, running from one concept to another, laying things apart in our mind so as to make them understandable. In order to grasp the, word, the world, we need concepts, right? We need uh, fixed terms in our mind that allow us to discuss the world, the world, sorry, to discuss the world in, a, in, a, in an analytic way. And analytic in Greek means tearing apart, bringing things apart from each other, laying them apart in order to uh, grasp them with your understanding. Knowledge, on the other hand, is innate and always true, as only true things can be known, says Augustine. In God, this knowledge comes down to a full grasp of the entirety of reality. In human beings, on the other hand, as an image of God, this knowledge is inarticulate. So the fullness of the knowledge that is in God is in fact inaccessible for human beings. It remains latent until it is grasped in concepts within our thought. The main characteristic of our thought thus is discursiveness, which is due to our temporal existence. We have been laid out in time, so we can't grasp the truth all at once, we have to lay it out again in temporary moments. The effect is that our thought and our being, opposite to God, do not coincide, and that we thus can only dimly reflect God's eternal thought. This also explains why in our human existence the access to knowledge is always mediated through thought. We first need to articulate or form, as Augustine says, the object of knowledge by which we transform it into a thought or a concept, juxtaposed to and different from other concepts. As you know from Descartes, if you are a philosopher, the, the, the clear and distinct ideas which, which al allow us to discuss the, um, the structure of the world. This conceptualization, that's what happens in thought, is what Augustine refers to as our inner word. Um, it is an expression of knowledge, so of a knowledge that is inaccessible, but that becomes expressible by the fact that we translate it, form it into a thought, um, which thus reveals part of the whole truth, but which always remains partial. It comes to be as the formation of something previously unformed as something of our mind that gets a form by becoming a thought. We gain and lose in this exercise. What we gain is understanding and discursive reasoning. So it allows us to talk about the world. What we lose is the full vision of reality implied in knowledge. We need words, inner words that is, in order to think the world. But by using them, we are always thrown at a distance from a full comprehension of the world. So we want to discuss the world by using terms, but by using terms, we lose the, the oversight or we lose the, 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 the grasp, the full grasp of reality all at once, which is a privilege of God's thought. As this inner word precedes any sensible expression, so we are not yet talking, we are just thinking, right? Um, as this inner word precedes any sensible expression, it also precedes any possible language. Text number one on your handout. I hope everyone at least has access to uh, a handout. Maybe not uh, every each, each and everyone uh, individually, but okay, as long as you have the text before you. I'm not going to read this one aloud. Um, we'll see how far we get in terms of, of time in discussing the text. In any case, the structure is as follows. So just to lay it out again. Um, our knowledge is inarticulate yeah, until it is expressed in thought, meaning in concepts, those bullets representing uh, individual separate thoughts, uh, ideas, yeah, concepts, um, which in turn is expressed in language what is called the external word, yeah? 
um, and ultimately refers to external things. But the, the movement comes from knowledge through uh, the inner world towards the external world. The nature of the sensible world is rather straightforward. It is the expression of an insight or a thought reached by the mind, and in order to establish the truth value of this external word, one needs to investigate the correspondence between the word and the thought it is designed to express. So this is a very common concept of truth, which you find in Thomas Aquinas, ad aequatio rei et intellectus, so the, the correspondence between a thing and my, my thought, if there is a correspondence, you have truth. Or Wittgenstein's uh, picture theory of meaning, in which a state of affairs is reflected in the proposition we make about it. And if those two correspond, we have truth. Yeah? Truth as correspondence between thought and things. So this is a rather unproblematic uh, theory of resemblance. But there is more to it. As Augustine says in text 2, in opposition to God's eternally truthful word, our internal word is true only when it corresponds to what we know. Text 2, which I'll read. We must therefore, says Augustine, come to that word of man, to the word of a living being, endowed with reason, to the word of the image of God, not born of God, but made by God. This word cannot be uttered in sound nor thought in the likeness of sound, such as must be done with the word of any language. It precedes all the signs by which it is signified and is begotten by the knowledge which remains in the mind when this same knowledge is spoken inwardly, just as it is. For the sight of thought is very similar to the sight of knowledge. For when it is spoken through a sound or through some bodily sign, it is not spoken just as it is, but as it can be seen or heard through the body. When, therefore, that which is in the knowledge is in the word, then this is a true word. And the truth which is expected from man, so that what is in the knowledge is also in the word, and what is not in the knowledge is not in the word. The truth value of the inner word in this text is again understood as a correspondence between our knowledge and the inner word. So the first part of the passage is about the correspondence between our thoughts and knowledge. But um, our inner word is not always true, he says, not just because it fails to correspond to our knowledge, that would be correspondence theory, right? There is uh, this, is, this is different from that one, so this can't be true if there is correspondence between the two, the tru the tru and only then there can be truth. So um, our inner word is not always true, not just because it fails to correspond, but also because of what one could call a structural deficiency in our knowledge. Our inner word lacks transparency because its referent, which is in fact God's knowledge, is inaccessible to us. So, um, if that is the case, then our question should be, if the truth of our inner word consists in our saying what we know, as he says, and if we have no full access to our knowledge, then how can we ever know if our inner word is true? That's the problem, right? If we are dealing with a knowledge uh, concept of correspondence of truth, then how can we know if a thought corresponds to knowledge, if knowledge remains in inaccessible to us. We, we, are, we are not in a place to verify if our thought in fact corresponds to what is in the knowledge. Augustine does not raise the question in so many words and seems to be taking an easy way out by saying that our knowledge is always true, yeah, because what is known is true, period. Yeah. Um, but in the discussion of the differences between the divine word and our inner word, another conception is lurking. The possibility of falsity and error in our inner word is taken seriously after all, and it is seen as caused by the incomplete access we have to our own knowledge. In that case, we would never fully know if our thoughts correspond to our knowledge unless we assume that our thoughts are the expression 
of something that, despite our incomplete access to it, is true in itself. So the, the standard of truth is not the correspondence between those two, but the fact that something is lying here that is always going to be true, right? Um, we may thus infer that Augustine is dealing with another conception of truth in this case, which is much more important in his work than the correspondence theory. It is no longer a truth of correspondence, but the truth that is our knowledge itself. It is what our inner master, he says, also in De Magistro, in On the Master, has taught us, which is not fully accessible, but which is nevertheless present within us. The inner word, we might say, is true in a derived sense, if it is an expression of this truth that lies within our knowledge. Are you still there? <laughs> okay. This reveals the fragile nature of Augustine's conception of truth. Um, uh, correspondence theory of truth is, is always very strong, right? You can just say verify by looking at the facts. In this case, Augustine's um, uh, conception of truth, uh, in Augustine's conception of truth, truth can obviously, or our, our conception, our notion about the world can obviously be abused or misled, which is a risk that is taken into account as we shall see. But the fragility also lies in the fact that due to its structure, and particularly due to our ultimate lack of knowledge, our access to truth with will always be provisional. So we have no full access to what is here, but we know that the truth lies, uh, uh, lies there. This means, on the other hand, that there is not one exclusive way to this truth. Not one single expression is the fully correct one. Truth is subdivided into concepts which all reveal part of this truth, okay? So every concept has truth in it, even though it's not the full expression of that truth, which as a full expression has become impossible. Uh, hence, any expression will have to be interpreted in order to assess its merits in revealing truth. This statement extends to all expressions, including the text of the Bible. From Augustine's analysis, it may appear that Scripture as God's Word is not equivalent to Christ as God's Word. The Bible contains the inspired writings by Moses, David and the others, but they remain human expressions in a specific language even, uh, which need to be interpreted. So they are, they are in fact at this stage of the external word uh, expressed in a language which needs to be interpreted in order to get to the truth, yeah. right? This brings me to the second part. The hermeneutics of scripture is the theme of the entire third book of Augustine's on Christian teaching. It is prepared by the discussions in the preceding books, the second book dwelling on a theory of the function of science, uh, signifiers that is, uh, not, not uh, uh, signs as, as in, in physics. Yeah? Uh, signs based on a rather rudimentary distinction between a thing, res, and the sign, signum, that represents it or refers to it. In this way, the second book of uh, On Christian Teaching underpins the principles laid down in On Christian Teaching 1, where Augustine argued that Christian doctrine is based, first and foremost, on the double commandment to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. This principle of love, caritas, the principle of charity, yeah, uh, has to be the true spirit in which scripture must be read. Text three. Whoever thinks he has understood the divine scriptures or any part of them in such a way that his understanding does not build upon the twin love of God and neighbor has not yet understood them at all. That is to say, Veritas is dependent on caritas. The truth of scripture can only be revealed to those who retrieve its message with love. This principle of charity, in its most literal meaning, is complemented by the Pauline qualification of a pure heart, a good conscience, and an unfeigned faith, 1 Corinthians, 
1313. Uh, if all of these are in place, one may approach the scriptures with conf confidence. Text 4, which I won't read. We here find a similar structure to that of our relating to the inner word. The truth of scripture reveals itself not as propositional or as a correspondence between sign and signified, but as the result of a specific way of relating to the scriptures. It is an event that happens when we are looking with the right eyes, meaning with the eyes of Christian charity. The criterion of truth is not the capturing of a true reference intended by the texts or its author, but the intention of the one who interprets the text. Since the 19th century, by, by people like Friedrich Schleiermacher, our hermeneutics has been formed in terms of retrieving the objective nature of what the author intended to say. That's what I was taught when I was studying classics, right? Um, don't do anything else than to retrieve the, 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 the truth or the meaning intended by the author. Augustine is saying, that's not what happens. What happens is we need a good intention as a reader and this intention will reveal truth. It is a matter of standing in the truth, a truth that is present in us and which we recognize in the Bible as a sign. If and when we approach the signs with the right questions, then truth will happen. Okay? Moreover, as external words never exhaust the full meaning of the inner word, remember that's where we stood in the, in the previous scheme, which is now taken up as external word as scripture, right? Um, um, as external words never exhaust the full meaning of the inner word, so they do not fully express the meaning of God's word in scripture. In the case of our inner word, we could say that what we have in mind is always more than what our external word can express. Likewise, the Bible as an external word never contains only one access to truth. As Jean Grondin puts it, interpreting is searching for words for what can never be entirely said or comprehended, entailing that there are multiple access ways to partial explanations of the expression. In the following passage, on the handout taken from the 11th book of the Confessions, Augustine makes the explicit connection between his exegesis and his views on non-linguistic inward truth, thus neatly summarizing the analysis we have been unfolding thus far. I'll start reading from a bit further down in the text. Where are we? Text number five. Um, <laughs> The second line of the second page. Yet how would I know whether or not he, Moses, was telling me the truth? So he's, he's been saying, uh, Moses spoke Hebrew, I don't understand Hebrew, um, so the word has come to me through translation, through, through external expression and so on. How would I know whether Moses is telling me the truth? If I did know this, I could not be sure of it from him. Moses would not tell me that, that he's telling the truth. Within me, within the lodging of my thinking, there would speak a truth which is neither Hebrew, nor Greek, nor Latin, nor any barbarian tongue, English, <laughs> and which uses neither mouth nor tongue as instruments and utters no audible syllables. It would say, what he is saying is true. And I, being forthwith assured, would say with confidence to the man possessed by you, what you say is true. So scripture talks to us through the love that connects us to truth and we discover the truth of the word. It does not convey its truth to, ours, to, to, to us in an objective, direct way. We are far from correspondence theory of truth. And it's not a, correspond and it, it's not a surprise sorry, that Augustine's theory of hermeneutics has been welcomed by people like Hans-Georg Gadamer. In the third part of his Wahrheit und Methode, Truth and Method, 
Gadamer speaks highly of Augustine. You should know, um, just as an, as an excursion, uh, Gadamer's point is, in the 19th century, um, historical scholarship has discovered the objectivity of the object, right? So what you need is, as I said before, Schleiermacher saying, you need to do to uncover what, what objective meaning uh, the author was intending. What Gadamer adds, and his life spans the entire 20th century, is, was born in 1900, I think, and died in 2010, something like that, or yeah, it was very old. Um, in 1960, Gadamer adds a point and says, it's not about, let's say, historically contextualizing the object, but it's about historically contextualizing the subject, the interpreter itself. <laughs> yeah? um, to make this point a bit more clear, um, go in and watch movies yeah, uh, about, for instance, Roman antiquity. It's not a coincidence that movies from the 30s and the 40s would be stressing Rome as a system, maybe in a fascist way even, as, as confirming the discipline and the, the force uh, and of the imperium of the Romans, that in the 60s you would find heroes who go against the system and fight it and, and, and are brilliant individuals, that's the 60s, and that in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, yeah, you would find uh, a structure of Roman society in which the, uh, the individuals are only players who move maybe a small button or can push a small button, but who don't change the entire uh, structure of society. That's revealing, not of Roman antiquity, but of us, right? Of our way of looking at historical, uh, historical periods. It's, it's rev revealing more about the 30s, 40s, the 60s, and the 80s, 90s, and so on, than it is about Roman antiquity, okay? You can say, yeah, but those movies never had the intention of unveiling objective truth, but at the same time, yeah, they could have chosen, um, let's say, a, a, a fully, a fully fantasized period or maybe something that did not exist historically. That they chose Roman antiquity is relevant for what they want to express in terms of interpreting the world. And that's what Gadamer is stressing. Yeah? It's not about the historical veracity of, of uh, finding objective truth. It's about the truth that is hidden within the, the stance of the interpreter, yeah? the way in which the interpreter is looking, is, um, is making truth happen, okay? So, in, his th in the third part of his uh, Truth and Method, Gadamer speaks highly of Augustine, whom he considers an exception to the Western forgetfulness, oblivion of language, Sprachvergessenheit. In Augustine's theory, Gadamer found corroboration of his own view that any linguistic utterance is dialogical rather than logical. But we'll see what that means. Text 6. The inner word, so he takes over Augustinian language, by expressing thought, expressing thought, represents the finiteness of our discursive understanding. Because our understanding does not embrace what it knows in one single comprehensive <coughs> glance, that's knowledge, yeah, it must always produce out of itself what it thinks and present it to itself as if in an inner dialogue with itself. In this sense, all thought is a speaking to oneself. According to Gadamer, the emphasis that is generally put on the propositional structure of truth should be, that's the correspondence theory, should be replaced by a hermeneutics of question and answer, whereby any proposition should be seen as a reply to an implicit question. Truth lies not in the understanding of the propositional contents, but rather in unraveling the dialectic of question and answer that underlies a specific linguistic utterance. That is to say, truth cannot be deduced from the propositional structure of the phrase, but it must be uncovered by laying open the presuppositions expressed in the form of questions that motivate the utterance of this phrase. Text 7. Every proposition has presuppositions that it does not express. 
Only he who also grasps this presupposition can really measure the truth of a proposition. Now I maintain that the question is the ultimate logical form of such motivation for every proposition. So what you say is always issued by your presuppositions, which can always be formulated in terms of your questions about reality. Think of the time when, as you call him, it's very funny, Bush 43 yeah, um, invaded Iraq and talked about freedom. Yeah? Every speech was about freedom, about bringing democracy by, by bombing people. Right? Um, the relevant interpretation of what is going on would have to be, what is your question underlying your notion of freedom? What do you mean by freedom? What is the presupposition out of which you use this word? It's not about what does freedom mean in, the, in an encyclopedia or in, 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 in a dictionary. It's about what people mean when they use words, right? And that's not something objective. It's something that has to be unraveled through the questions they, that underlie their presuppositions. In this way, Gadamer indicates what is at stake in Augustine's theory of the inner word and in his biblical hermeneutics. And even though, as I shall argue later on, there remain important differences between Gadamer's 20th century reading and Augustine's late ancient views, they both agree on the fact that truth is not lying out there as an objective fact, but that it resides in here, meaning in the interpreter's position. This attitude may be recognized, this, if this is a bit outlandish for you, but you can recognize this attitude in experiences that are very common, yeah? um, like the aesthetic adumbration of truth in art or in listening to music. Truth is communicated through art in, 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 an, in, in a totally non-discursive way. Yeah? You see the truth, you grasp the truth about the world by looking at a picture, by listening to music. Yeah? And yet you have to start explaining this and then yeah, you, you're gone again. You, you, you use concepts and ideas and you lose the full grasp of the, of the, the truth which you have seen in this work of art. Truth happens when our questions are answered in a relevant way or when our inner word reflects our intimate knowledge. Thus, Augustine's truth is a self-realization rather than a discovery of an external objective reality. As one sets out to unravel the meaning of words or of scripture with a faithful attitude, that is with a pure heart, a good conscience and an unfeigned faith, then one will find the truth internal to us and at the same time coinciding with God. Augustine himself raises an obvious objection to this. People can obviously be wrong in their interpretation of scripture. Whoever, he says, in reading scripture as, uh, whoever in reading scripture has a different opinion from the one who wrote it is wrong insofar as scripture does not lie. You can't make scripture say whatever you want, right? But he imme immediately adds the fo following qualification, text 8. Yet, as I was saying, if, if he is wrong by interpreting the text in such a way <laughs> that he still builds up charity, he is wrong in the same way as someone who <coughs> leaves the road by mistake, but nonetheless goes on through a field to the same place to which the road leads. You take a shortcut, you're, you're, you're led astray, but you, you, you get, in the end, you get there where you want it to be. So in the end, even if what you're doing is wrong in inter interpreting the text, as long as it is um, driven by charity, by love, you will get there, yeah? which, is, which is a very strange, a particular fragile notion of truth. The principle of charity, um, elaborated in book one of on Christian teaching, alongside the theory of science expounded in book two, thus lays the ground for a more detailed hermeneutics of scripture, which Augustine presents in the third book of on Christian teaching. Augustine there explains, among other principles of exegesis, how uncertain passages should be read. If a certain biblical passage can have different meanings, 
one should retrieve the true one by adducing evidence from other passages. Text 9, which is stating the Schleiermacher principle, look for objective meaning by bringing together what the author has been writing and, and you will find a, a, an objective truth there. That is a sound hermeneutical principle, holding that many interpretations may equally apply as long as their truth value is warranted by the support of other biblical passages. Yet, the case is more difficult if there is no such support. Text 10. However, when a meaning is elicited whose uncertainty cannot be resolved by the evidence of places in the scriptures whose meaning is certain, it remains to make it more clear by recourse to reason, and then it follows, even if he whose words we seek to understand did not perhaps intend that meaning. But this is a dangerous pursuit, he immediately uh, draws back a bit, we shall walk much more safely with the aid of the scriptures themselves, right? But if that doesn't work, your reason is capable of finding a truth, even if that is not the same one as the one uh, the writer, the author, intended. This clearly goes far beyond the hermeneutical precepts laid down in the 19th century, uh, still influential in present-day scholarship, namely that one should try and retrieve the original meaning as intended by the author. As Augustine makes clear, there is not one true meaning, but a plurality of true meanings, not depending on the author's intention, but on the reader's truthful attempt to reveal a true meaning of the text. Let's go on to the third and final part. We have had veritas, we had caritas. Let's go on to unitas now. In the 12th book of the Confessions, as in many other works, Augustine puts his biblical hermeneutics into practice. More in particular, he sets out to interpret the first two verses of Genesis in this book. At crucial moments, he interrupts his exegesis to formulate a number of second-level observations on the method and principles of exegesis. In text 13, he quotes 2, Tim 2 Timothy 2.14, indicating that he does not wish to quarrel about words, and he adds that this should leave freedom in interpreting the words of Scripture. Text 13. So what difficulty is it for me when these words can be interpreted in various ways, provided only that the interpretations are true. What difficulty is it for me, I say, if I understand the text in a way different from someone else who understands the scriptural author in another sense? As long as each interpreter is endeavoring to find in the Holy Scriptures the meaning of the author who wrote it, what evil is it if an exegesis he gives is uh, one shown to be true by you, light of all sincere souls, even if the author whom he is reading did not have that idea, and though he had grasped the truth, had not discerned that scene by the interpreter. So an interpreter can find more truth in the words of the biblical author, author than the author has put in there himself. This means, fully in line with the principles expounded in Christian teaching, that any interpreter is free to read into the text whatever expression of truth they may find there, provided that they are looking for truth, even to the extent that this truth may not have been expressed by the author himself. He may not even have envisaged this particular meaning. At this point, one might be tempted to think of all those poor figures whose heterodoxy was fiercely fought against by Augustine, the Donatists, Pelagius, Celestinus, Justinus, uh, Julianus, sorry, and so on. Wouldn't they have been grateful if they had been allowed only a small portion of the hermeneutic freedom Augustine here reserves for himself mm -hmm. and those who stand in the truth? We shall have to come back to that. Of course, this raises the urgent necessity of defining the correct attitude that occasions this hermeneutic freedom, as Augustine thematized it in text 4. What is the good intention of the one who reads scripture? What is the pure heart, the uh, good conscience and the unfeigned faith? 
Isn't this a way to justify any truth claim, even if it concerns, sorry, alternative facts or cynical manipulations of ignorant people? Isn't the phrase, my word is truthful and the rest is fake, most used by dictators, propagandists of totalitarian regimes and all other people who want to secure their power by twisting the truth. And yet they all claim that only their inter intention is the right one. We here enter the kernel of the fragility of Augustine's conception of truth. In his theory, the reply cannot simply be to verify the facts, right? As the facts that are seen depend on the intention of the viewer and the fullness of truth is never revealed to our discursive mind. There we are again. And still Augustine does have a reply to arbitrary truth claims. The short version of this reply is humility. The ultimate criterion to establish a person's heart being pure, their conscience being good and their faith being unfeigned is their humility. That is to say, their responsiveness to God. In order to explain this, we may have recourse to what Augustine says at On True Religion in text 14. Do not go outside, come back into yourself. It is in the inner self that truth dwells. And if you find your own nature to be subject to change, transcend even yourself. But remember, when you are transcending yourself, that is your reasoning soul transcending yourself, so then direct your course to what the light of reason itself gets its light from. Where after all does every good reasoner arrive but at the truth? Since truth herself, of course, does not reach herself by a process of reasoning, but is herself what reasoners are aiming at, see there the concord which cannot be surpassed and put yourself in accord with her. So your reason has to transcend itself towards the source of light on which reason is dependent and there it will find the truth. Augustine explains here how the inward motion of the self leads towards a vision of transcendent truth, which is God himself. In order to get there, we need discursive reason as a ladder, yeah, to use a familiar expression, but we also need to let go of the ladder in order to make the final move above and beyond discursive reason. We enter a world of seeing the truth, as in um, contem contemplating a work of art, right, without being able to lay it out in a discursive way. We rather understand this truth in our doubts, as Augustine goes on to explain in text 15, where he says, or if you are not sure what I am saying and have doubts about whether it is true, at least be sure that you have no doubt about your having doubts about this. This is very <laughs> sophistical, right? Um, and if it is certain that you do have doubts, ask where this certainty comes from. Everyone who understands that he has doubts is understanding something true. Yeah? It's Descartes. Yeah? I, I am doubting, but not Descartes in, in full sense, right? I am doubting, but by doubting, I know I, for sure that I'm doubting. So I know something true. Okay? So there is truth even in doubting. He is certain, therefore, about something true. So then, everyone who has doubts whether there is such a thing as truth has something true in himself about which he cannot have any doubts. And there cannot be anything true except with truth. So we discover something true, which is a very minimal something, right? It's just the fact that we are doubting. But at the same time, our doubt is put between brackets by our accessing something true through the doubt. Okay? And if there is something true, it, there needs to be truth lying behind that in order for this to be true. That's, that's the, um, the association he makes here. I believe this reference to doubt in order to explain our access to truth is not just sophistical, rhetorical or didactic. It is adding something essential to the analysis, namely the fact that a person's genuine attitude to the ultimate truth presupposes their doubting whether their understanding is the correct one. Given, as we saw, that we have no direct access to truth, 
we can only use this truth as some kind of criterion to judge whether each and every attempt to reach it is a good one or not. Um, if, if, if someone says something and you say, this can't be true, no? you can only express this opinion by having access somehow to a, a remote criterion of truth that you are setting um, into practice. Yeah? You, you, you use a truth value, even if you don't grasp what it is, but you are using it into practice um, while, uh, when you are um, denoting something as this can't be true. Um, those who abuse other people's credulity, propagandists, populists and other kinds of conmen, including some media but even elected presidents, are doing this for the sake of their own power claims. They pursue their own goals and live a life dictated by self-interest or self-preservation. The people who stand in the truth, on the other hand, are led by God's will, not because they would know what God wants, but rather bec because they admit that they don't know what God wants and receive what little grace they are given with humility and gratitude. That's the function of doubt in this, uh, in this context, I think. The passage from true religion is remarkably close to what Augustine writes about his encounter with truth upon reading the books of the Platonists in Confessions 7. There, however, he adds an important element which allows us to further articulate this rather oblique relation to truth. For the description of the ascent in Confession 7 is introduced by the following words, text 16. From there, I was admonished to return into myself. With you as my guide, I entered into my innermost citadel and was given power to do so because you had become my helper. I entered <coughs> and with my soul's eye, such as it was, saw above, that, saw above that same eye of my soul the immutable light higher than my mind. In fact, if you, if, if you compare this with the text we have been reading just before, uh, text 15 is explaining, uh, text 14, I'm sorry, is explaining exactly the same movement. The person who knows the truth knows it, knows this light. And he who knows it knows eternity. Love knows it. Eternal truth and true love and beloved eternity, you are my God. That is to say, the experience may be mine, but the ascent is only possible upon God's initiative. He is, as Augustine says, the guide and helper who gives me the power to enter into my innermost citadel. I am elevated above and beyond myself by the eruption of God who interrupts my selfish aspirations. As thematized by Jean-Luc Marion, my true self is accessed by some form of loss of self, in which I am responsive to a force that transcends me. And this eternal truth, Augustine says, is not attained by reason, but by love. Love knows it. We do not relate to this truth in a directly discursive way, but rather by standing in it, I have no better expression than that, by orienting our lives to this ultimate criterion, which is at the same time pre-discursive and supra-discursive, which we discover as something novel that in fact predates us indefinitely, as something external that is in fact more internal than our inner self and higher than our highest self. Confronted with this truth, our incertitude or doubt is the most reliable token that we are onto it. We recognize the value of attempts at reaching it and at the same time we acknowledge that any attempt falls short of grasping the full extent of the truth. We are thus interrupted by it and at the same time called to humility. Augustine further explains that the meaning of the text must not be limited to the literal wording of it, but in the light of the truth, he says, the words of scriptures must be interpreted within the framework of Christian philosophy. And this is not limited to Augustine himself. 
anyone who shares the light of the truth is entitled to read their meaning into the text, even if it were different from Augustine's true interpretation. One of the reasons for this is again the intrinsically human failure to express ourselves in a fully transparent way and to understand other people's intended meaning. Yet the cause of this plurality of interpretations is not what, what occupies Augustine's mind here. The important thing here is that this plurality be taken seriously as a determining element of hermeneutics. And the son of Monica has to admit that everyone, from accomplished theologians up to uneducated persons like Monica, may find truth in scripture, provided that they are standing in the truth and accessing it with an, an, uh, a pure heart, um, a, a good conscience and an unfeigned faith. So how, uh, the way in which scripture talks to us can be extrapolated to the way in which scripture talks to other people. They also having access to a truth, which is their interpretation, which can be equally true as my interpretation. <coughs> in text uh, 18 and 19, Augustine reaffirms that Moses' words, like a source that produces a large number of rivers and side canals, can be taken in different senses without losing its unique limpid truth. I'm going to skip that for reasons of time. What we read in Confessions 12 is a plea for the use of right reason, which is to be trusted in interpreting the scriptures, but only in so far as it is informed by the truth of Christian faith. That faithful attitude is the basic presupposition, the condition even for the self-realization of hermeneutic truth as Augustine understands it. Scriptural, scriptural exegesis is not so much looking for the author's true intention, but looking for the truth that any reader may find for themselves. Text 20. So, when one person has said, Moses thought what I, what I say. So, I know what Moses was saying because that's what I think. And another, know what I say. I think, Augustine says, it more religious in spirit to say, why not rather say both, if both are true? And if someone sees a third or fourth and a further truth in these words, why not believe that Moses discerned all these things? For through him, the one God has tempered the sacred books to the interpretation of many who could come to see a diversity of truths. This is an appeal to an interpreter's humility, certainly, but it is also, as this passage tells us, a matter of greater religiosity. He says, religiosius, yeah, more religious in spirit. The true attitude towards the biblical text is not one of exclusive truth claims, but one of connecting in a religious way to a truth to which any reader has access, however simple or sophisticated their intellectual abilities may be. It is a truth that speaks to us in an inward way and which we can find wherever we look for it in whatever way. In this vein, Veritas, which we saw was closely connected to Caritas, is also the bearer of Unitas, a polyphone unity to which every single person has access, each in their own way, and in which all different perspectives ought to be combined as tokens that point us towards the unique, inaccessible truth itself. Truth is thus constitutive of a community. As Augustine says in the City of God, text 21, the definition of what it is to be a people is dependent on their common agreement on things to be loved. And as we have seen, the object of love is the truth that resides in our inner world. That is how Veritas, Caritas and Unitas cohere. They form a community of people who all in their own way contribute to finding the ultimate truth. Charity and true faith transform all interpretations into useful resources to attain a unique truth. 
That is ultimately the reason why heretic or condemned authors are not allowed this freedom of exegesis. As their faith is not genuine, they lack sincere charity and their reasoning will not help them climb out of the marsh of their heresy, which is disruptive of unity. As opposed to contemporary views, such as Gadamer's or such as postmodern readings of truth, or of Augustine for that matter, Augustine's hermeneutics is fully contextualized within the horizon of true faith. For Augustine, there is an objective truth lying behind any attempt to understand scripture. And however pluralistic, non-dogmatic and generous towards other interpretations this may be, there is a clear line between readings that remain true to faith and readings that fall short of it. After all, timeless and eternal truth needs to be respected and can only be received in a spirit of humility and meekness. And maybe the interpreter's incertitude, yeah, uncertainty, is the best token of this spirit of humility and meekness. If you know that God is on your side, when the when First World War was going on, the Germans had bells saying, God mit uns, yeah, God is with us. How would they know? Yeah? The telephone was not even invented to call to heaven. Right? Um, where was I? Um, so um, this, this timeless truth can only be received in a spirit of humility and meekness. At the same time, this timeless and eternal truth is not separate from our inner word. In that respect, Augustine's posi position does open a notion of hermeneutic truth that depends on the intention, not of the author of the text, but of the interpreter. This attitude of the interpreter allows truth to happen as a hermeneutical event without, for that matter, becoming relativistic or subjectivistic. The congruity between veritas, caritas and unitas, meaning the multifarious ways in which people are standing in the same unitary truth, provided that they obey the double commandment of caritas, ultimately warrants the objective nature of truth. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Augustine said that the fullness of humility is that you know yourself. And anybody who is in or has taken an ACS course knows how important it is that we know ourselves. So we thank you for being an ACS professor today. <laughs> L11. That Augustine goes as far as saying, and thus a man, a human being, who is resting upon faith, hope, and love, and who keeps a firm hold upon these, does not need the scriptures except for the purpose of instructing others. That is going very far, right? And I don't think in his more um, prudent moments he would repeat that. I mean, um, how do we know that in the first place we need this double commandment of, of loving God and our neighbor? Because it is in scripture, right? So the, 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 the principle of charity is a scriptural prin principle which we can only know through scripture. Yeah? And if you then say, yeah, so you don't need scripture anymore once you have, you have this, uh, this, this charity, yeah, you can only get there through, through scripture. Yeah? And, and the question has been raised in Augustinian scholarship, what does this mean? Yeah? What, wh where does he rely on? And the answer seems to be, and, and that's something he also, Augustine also explicitly acknowledges, um, that you need at least a set of, of uh, uh, principles of belief, right? The, 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 how is it called in English? The, the, uh, the, 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 the profession of faith, right? Which the didn't exist. The rule of faith? The rule the articles of faith? Yeah, the articles of faith, the creed, which did not exist in, in Augustine's time, but which was the regula fidei, something like, what, do, what is the, the core business of our faith? And, and I think that's, that would be his answer. You, you need at least this scriptural and magisterial background in order to, to be able to, 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 um, to determine whether you are accessing uh, the world and scripture with the right attitude. And, and I think you're right. So this presupposes a dialectic way of dealing with scripture, um, going back and forth, um, in, in, in a certain way, getting loose of scripture in terms of 
finding truth elsewhere also, but based on scripture through uh, a tradition of, 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 of doctrine, right? And that's, that's what you need, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it also say something about how you relate to your fellow human beings? Of course, yes, certainly, yeah, Unity. yeah, yeah. But, but even there, you could say, well, um, me as a, as a dictator, yeah, or for that matter, as a professor in class, I can, I can dictate, yeah, this is what you ought to believe out of my position of authority, which I could claim to be a correct way of handling other people's, other, other, other human beings, because I know what, what the truth is. So again, this can be abused, can be misused, can be misled and so on. You need <laughs> checks and balances, right? You need to have a, an independent access to truth through your own thought, through your own um, um, reason, which he explicitly puts forward as, as one of the criteria to get hold of the meaning of scripture, um, discerning for yourself whether what is going on is true. So this truth in, in indeed presupposes a community but also presupposes the ability of every individual to discern the truth claim that, is, that has been made. Yeah? Yeah. I, I don't know if this answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, of knowledge, is it limited only to the knowledge of God or does it extend beyond that? So for example, Augustine Um, well, you need to know what, what this conception of God is, and, and of course the, the, this is also multifarious, but um, he has this distinct uh, theory of illumination, which in the Middle Ages has been more elaborated than it was in Augustine, but the idea is everything that can be found in the world as something true has, uh, is present in the thought of God as well. So the knowledge of God is in fact, maybe yeah, if you want to compare it to an ar architectural plan that encompasses the whole world before even it was made. Yeah? So uh, it's, it's like the Platonic ideas, and uh, I think that's where he got his, 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 his influence from, saying uh, there are eternal, true, uh, unique um, notions, intelligible notions that remain in place for eternity in God's thought, and everything that is created is a reflection in some way or other, an image yeah, of uh, what is thought by God. So I think the answer would be any example you would give of something that would not relate to God would ultimately be brought, be brought back to God's thought. Yeah? So there is, there is nothing outside that, I think. Um, thank you for it was fascinating. Um, one thing that I was wondering about, and it's, it's not so much in your in this paper, but I'm wondering about your thoughts on um, you talk about like how humanity relates to truth, it relates to God, and the problem of like finiteness, you know, yes. human, humans like incapacity. Uh, but I'm also wondering for Augustine, like what would be like considered like you know natural human incapacity versus the fall versus like corruption. Uh, and, and if there's a distinction there. Uh. Um, well, there is, no, there is no human existence without a fall, right? Um, so the, 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 the natural capacities that are employed by humans mm -hmm. presuppose their fallen condition, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure where your question is heading, but you could you could extrapolate and say well but this, this the condition we have been talking about Eve uh, yesterday and creation uh, the condition of a human being before the fall of course God would, would have foreknown foretold that would be a fall but also the condition of human beings after the the, the, the full uh, reconciliation or what, what is the what is the English word the the, the, uh, the end of times oh. The redemption, yeah. um, um, indicates a state of human existence that is not, let's say, not not alterated, not 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 
um, Corrupt. corrupted anymore by the condition of the fall. And that might be an interesting place to look for. And there you would find all the structural elements of human, human existence um, in, a, in a glorified way. You would find the corporeal existence, the body. You would find sexuality, yeah? Mm -hmm. But without any strife, without any disruption, without any perversion, right? Um, and you would find full transparency of our thought. And, and I think that's where we get the yeah? transparency where all communication succeeds. Yeah? In, in this world, there is no communication that ever succeeds fully. Right? Whatever you say can be taken in the wrong way by other people. Well, in that condition, we would have a full capacity of expressing what we think in a, in a fully transparent way. Maybe that's what. That, that's exactly the, what I was wondering. Is like how much of that is due, due to like human, like being created as a less, you know, less than God, or how much of that is corrupt? That, that's very helpful. Yeah. So I think in, in both those conditions, pre-lapsarian and post-redemption, you, you would find this this condition, um, and it is not like some mo mostly the, the people in the Greek world, uh, Greek patristic authors would say this is a fully spiritualized. Uh, existence with no corporeality. Uh, Augustine is, is a Westerner and says there will be body, right? And we will enjoy it. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's much more human like in this, in what you find in this world than what you would find in, in Eastern interpretations of, of Greek Christianity, where they would stress the, the, the intellectuality of, of, of the, the existence that would be, would be uh, but that would remain uh, in that condition. So in that sense, because it was much more pro-body, pro, pro all those, uh, let's say, uh, sensible things than, than many of his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. uh, similar words could be referred to Augustine recognized that certain philosophers could also have certain grasp of truth. And so I'm wondering how would he, in some way, say that they too were able to access our truth and love and faith? How, how would that go? No. If they do, they are Christians, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a pity for them, but they, they are lost for, 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 for uh, salvation. In the sense that, not, not that they miss the point, right? In, 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 in uh, City of God, uh, what is it, uh, 19, at the end, he says, uh, they, they access the virtues, they access everything that can be understood in, in a good way, let's say intellectually. But they lack the basic condition of humility, which, makes, which would make them um, susceptible for salvation in, in the sense that so he, he, he says there all the virtues of the pagans are in fact vices yeah? and why are they vices not because they, they misunderstood the nature of what the virtue should be but that they access them in, with their own intentions they, they thought they would be capable by themselves by the force of their own uh, rationality to get um, at this, this, this beatitude which Augustine uh, fully denies. Yeah? He says he, they, they are they are proud, yeah? and so they are fallen prey to the, the worst uh, vice, which is pride. Yeah? Um, at the same time, he says, um, I think in David Religion, I'm not sure. He says um, if Plato and Socrates were to return, and he would change only a bit of their doctrines, they would be Christian. <laughs> they're so, they're, they're, they're really good, yeah? so um, he, he at, in, in this passage he's in, in fact um, he's in fact um, accepting their influence yeah? he's, he's saying well what we say as Christians and what I say as Augustine uh, comes from Plato and comes from the Platonic tradition yeah? yet at the same time he refuses to, to accept that they would be um, uh, would have real virtue because they lack faith and humility that comes with it. So the, the point is not that they lack the, the truth of faith which could only exist after the existence of Christ, right? But that they had the wrong attitude which uh, failed them to see that in fact they need God's grace to get where they are um, instead of their own proper, uh, the force of their own proper uh, rationality. That's the point.